coming to today's public lecture program. It's the final one in the 2014-2015 academic year. It's our pleasure to host Dr. Aaron Thomas from the University of Montana, mm -hmm. where he's a chemical engineer in the chemistry department. Right. Aaron got his undergraduate degree in chemical engineering, mm -hmm. did everything in, from Stanford University, then he went on and got his PhD in chemical engineering mm -hmm. from the University of Florida, after which he came across the country away from a coast into into the mountains. I Moscow, Idaho, mm -hmm. to be a chemical engineer and faculty member in the chemical engineering department there. And just about two years ago, right. he uh, moved over to the University of Montana, where he's associate professor of chemistry in the chemistry department, in spite of being a chemical engineer. That's right. He also is the director of the Native American Research Center mm -hmm. at the University of Montana, which has an absolutely glorious um, Building and he has a he is the Montana's director of the Sloan program for Native American students in, in graduate school. So great. I'm going to let you give your talk. Thank you. And uh, it's all yours. All right. Well, I know it's a busy time. I know it's finals, but I appreciate you all taking your time out to come and listen to my talk today. I actually have a couple of connections to Montana Tech even before I came to. Um, to, to Montana, to the University of Montana. So like Bev mentioned, I was at the University of Idaho for about 11 years teaching in chemical engineering. And part of that time we had a dean. His ne dean's name was Don Blackheader. So who then came here, of course, and he's here with you all. Uh, my other connection that I have is uh, we had a person who was our ad administrative assistant in our department. Her name was Gail Bergman. If you happen to know who she is, she came to the University of Idaho and it was in chemical engineering. So I actually got to know Gail quite well. Quite well. I got to know Don quite well, too, uh, well, during his time as, as dean. Um, and I've been here maybe five or six times, and I have yet to see him. So <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Maybe, 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 maybe he'll come today. So today, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, oh, I need big arms, uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of my research, research background that I've done that started at the University of Idaho and I brought now to the University of Montana. Then move on, kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about STEM education and the different Native American programs that we have in Montana. So a brief outline we're talking about. So what I primarily look at in research is we look at flow oscillations and how these flow oscillations can be used as a mechanical separation method. We first started out with looking at this in gases. And our primary motivation is, okay, how can we separate out gases using a mechanical separation scheme to maybe remove contaminants from the air, such as CO2 or other type of contaminants. So this was of interest to the space program, where uh, if you've ever seen Apollo 13, where they had to change out a membrane because the CO2 levels were too high, well, we thought, well, instead of taking membranes up that needed to be either replaced or regenerated, is there another way to do the separation that's on a mechanical means? So that's how we got our start looking at this area and looking at oscillating flows as a mechanical means for separation. We then moved on to, okay, if we can do this in gases, can we do this also in liquids? And what, were, what would be important to look at in liquids to separate? We decided to look at the separation of biological species, uh, perhaps um, cells, protein, uh, DNA, these sort of things. But in order to do that, we had to shrink the dimensions and look at on the microscale and also look at electroosmotic flows. Then I'm probably going to entirely shift gears and talk a little bit about uh, the indigenous research and STEM education program, which is right oversee. It used to be called the Native American Research Laboratory, if you're familiar with that. We've since rebranded it. Um, and now I'm the director of this program. And this was the, probably the main reason I came over from the University of Idaho to the University of Montana, was to oversee the ERSI program. And this program is trying to take a step-by-step -step, um, education from middle school through graduate school and also work directly with the tribal communities. So I'll kind of go through the different programs that we have so far, at least, with each of those levels. So beginning first with the research, I'll kind of give you an idea of how this works, how we're using these oscillating flows as a mechanical separation method. So imagine, if you will, if I had two large reservoirs, and they're connected by a long tube, and in these two large reservoirs I have, let's say, uh, let's say I have nitrogen in both reservoirs. Now one reservoir, let's say the one on your left, I also introduce a dilute amount of another species. Let's for now call that CO2. So I have CO2 and a dilute amount in nitrogen. Now if I just let it sit there, eventually you would get transport of the CO2 from one reservoir to the other through that tube because of diffusion. There's a concentration gradient. You'll get diffusion from one end to the other. 
And therefore, if you kind of think of the yellow as the CO2, it'll move from one reservoir through the tube to the other reservoir. Well, now let's change uh, the situation a little bit. Let's say I also have a piston in that tube on the left, and this piston oscillates back and forth in a purely oscillatory mode. So that on the forward stroke of the piston, I get a nearly parabolic flow profile that exists. So then what happens is the species not only diffuses axially down the tube, but also radially towards the boundary. So now you kind of think of its course sitting more towards the boundary. Well, now the piston stroke reverses itself. As it reverses itself, the species that was sitting on the boundary begins to kind of backflow a little bit, but then diffuse towards the center again. But it doesn't go back nearly as far as it went forward. And the reason is, is because it was residing near a slower flow region near the boundary, where the faster flow region was in the middle. So it didn't come back nearly as far as it went forward. So then on the next cycle, as the piston goes forward again, then the species is convected down the tube, again radially diffuses, and the whole process starts all over again. So you kind of imagine the species going in a zigzag, zigzag fashion down the tube from the core to the boundary, back to the core, and back again. You can get a major increase in your throughput in the mass transfer of your desired species over that due to pure diffusion just by having an, a flow oscillation. And again, there's no net flow for one end to the other. It's purely oscillatory. For those of you that are familiar with Taylor Aris dispersion, this is very similar to that, but for oscillating flows. Well, now let's imagine, instead of just having one dilute species, CO2, let's, say, let's introduce another dilute species. Let's call that methane. So now we're trying to separate the methane from the CO2. Well, they're both going to move at different rates down my tube. They have different diffusion coefficients. They're going to move at different rates. They're going to react a little bit differently with my flow profile that exists and then you can get a separation. And not only can you get a separation, you can actually tune it, which species comes out first. Sometimes the slower diffusing species will come out first, and sometimes the faster diffusing species will come out first. Depends on the amplitude of oscillation and also the frequency of oscillation as well. Now, we did quite a bit of work of this in gases, and we see um, how, this wor how the separation works, and so we have a theoretical model that we developed that also shows uh, what we predicted to happen. But I'm going to move from that, and we decided, okay, we see how this works in gases. How would this then work in liquids? And can we use this in another means? And that other means was in the separation of biological species. But in order to do that, because the diffusivities in liquid are about five times smaller than the diffusivities in gases, and so our tubes that we use for gases are about two centimeters or so on that order, well, we greatly have to shrink the dimensions of our channel. And so we then have to look at uh, we're doing this in microchannels. And our microchannels that we've started using were on the order of you know, 20, 25 microns. And instead of using like a piston to impose a pressure gradient over my microchannel, well, that's very difficult to do in microchannels because of the friction forces. We had to do this in another way. So the other way to decide to do this is to take advantage of electroosmotic flow that, uh, that, that can exist on dimensions that small and use an alternating field an AC field to produce our flow oscillations. So why? So what would be the motivation of doing this? Well, if we can work on some aspect of the separation of biological species, well then perhaps this could lead to a point of care device, a handheld point of care device that you can use in rural situations. So in other words, if you, most, most of the time these days you go to the doctor's office and they take a blood test and you wait two weeks and you get results back. Well, what if you can have something to give you the results right then and there, right when you need them? So this perhaps would be one of the steps that you would need then for that type of device. What we're also looking to do is, I know there's methods out there that do lab on a chip type studies in microchannels that can separate DNA, that can separate proteins, that can separate cells, but you have to use different techniques. For DNA, you have to do this. For protein, you have to do something else. You have to prepare them differently. Well, perhaps we can use a single robust method that can be used to separate a variety of biological species. So the one that I'm going to present now is, well, we're going to look at the separation of different size double-stranded DNA. So a quick tutorial on electroosmotic flow and how this works. So imagine here is the channel wall, and a channel wall will have a specific charge that's already associated with this. In this case, this is denoted as a negative charge. Well, right next to that channel wall, 
If this is the buffer solution that's electrically neutral in the bulk portion of it, even though it's electrically neutral in the bulk portion, near the wall or right next to the wall, there will be a buildup of charge. Right on the wall will be in a mobile layer, kind of like the no slip condition. So right next to the wall, immobile, but a few atoms away from it, you're gonna get what's called a diffuse layer. It's still a built up layer of charge, but it's mobile, it can actually move. So when you do a potential drop from one end to the other, this diffuse layer will then preferentially move towards one of the uh, uh, electrodes. So in this case, it'll probably move towards the negative side. And as it moves, it essentially drags the rest of the fluid along with it because of viscosity. So we thought, well, because of this fact that most people try to suppress when they do microchannel um, uh, work and looking at lab on chip systems, they try to actually suppress this electromosmotic flow. Well, maybe we can use it to our advantage. Maybe we can use this as our separation mechanism. So we're gonna put an alternating field on this where this, uh, the potential uh, uh, changes, positive and negative on both sides, get that diffuse layer to oscillate back and forth, which will in turn then oscillate the bulk that exists. So what we do is we make our microchannels on a, a glass dot slide, like on a microscope glass slide, and we use PDMS. We use photolithography techniques. Um, so essentially what we do is we uh, etch out or etch um, in the photolithography on a silicon disc what our uh, shape is going to be. Then we put the PDMS on top of that, and then when we peel it off, we have the mold and we have the shape that we want. Then we can cut it out and then put it on top of our glass slide. So here would be an example of what we would uh, have in our experiment. So it's a basic T-shaped uh, microchannel. So it's filled with buffer. In one end, we would put our, our mixture. So the mixture that we've been looking at uh, up to this point is we looked at two different base pairs of DNA and see if we can separate out those two different base pairs. So for example, that might go in this well. We put a potential drop here to then move that to the crosshairs. We then put the electrodes on wells one and two, start the alternating current, and find out how much separation that we get at a certain sampling point down the microchannel. So this would be the experimental setup that we put together. So the, the DNA um, is fluoresced, and so we have a spectrophotometer to help pick up the wavelengths and the intensity of the, uh, the wavelengths from the fluorescence. We also have a camera that kind of observes how the DNA then moves across the sampling point. Or we have mirrors that will help deflect the lasers that we have. The microchannel will sit right in there. So here's the main camera. The microchannel then is in there. We have the electrodes, which are here, which we put on the very end to drive the experiment. And we have housing and power supplies as well. We also have an oscilloscope so we can see what the alternating field or alternating current looks like that we supply to the electrodes. And this is also all hooked up to a computer. So this is what the information we get from the spectrophotometer. We get these history channel functions. So again, what we try to do is we put in two different base pairs and see what type of separation that we can get out of them. Well, what we get out of the spectrophotometer is two things. We get the wavelength that comes out and also the intensity of that wavelength. So these two graphs show two different situations for a 10 mer versus 50 mer or 10 base pair versus 50 base pair of double-stranded DNA. The 50, mer, the 50 mer is what comes out first. So its wavelength is about 540 nanometers. The 10 mer is what comes out next and its wavelength is about 430 nanometers. Okay, so that's what we have specified. We kind of know that because of the way they're fluorescently tagged. This little peak that we see here, what we believe that is, is when we hybridize the DNA, there's still some single-stranded DNA that exists in there, and that'll come out first. So we believe that's what this little peak is. But what we're primarily interested in is this peak here. So this first one shows what happens if we have no flow oscillations. If we have straight DC current, so a steady flow that goes all the way through, well, does the separation exist in that case? And the answer is yes. We do get a separation that can occur. But do the flow oscillations do anything? Do they make it better? Do they make it worse? If they make it better, how much do they make it better? 
And indeed, that is the case. So this shows the oscillating results for a positive bias of 325 and a negative bias of 75. So instead of no net flow in this case, there's actually a pulse. So a positive bias down that channel be at four hertz for our 10 mer versus 50 mer. And what we're trying to measure is the distance between these peaks. So the distance of, between those peaks will then tell us the resolution then that we're getting due to the flow as oscillations as opposed to those that do not oscillate. And as we can see in this case, again, that increases. So this was done multiple times on multiple number of microchannels. And then those were then statistically analyzed to see if we actually got anything different than what happened in the steady flow case. Well, it turns out, yes, we do. So here's the steady flow case for two different base pair combinations. This one is the 10 mer and the 50 mer. This one is the 10 mer and the 100 mer. And we can see as we increase the difference, if you can see those, increase the, if you want to call it the amplitude of the oscillation that we're imposing on there, then we get an increase in the separation. But it comes to a limit. So you, it, even though you increase the, ap the, amp the amplitude of the oscillation, um, you just can't continuously expect that to give you a greater separation. Eventually, there comes a point where it starts to go down. So that's one of the main things to notice in this graph. The other thing that may be curious is one might think, well, if this is 10 versus 50, and this is 10 versus 100, the difference between this two, these two, is so much different than these two. So why are we getting better separation for the 10 versus 50 versus the 10 versus 100? We believe what is happening is the 100 mer is so large, it's actually in ca causing entanglement issues. So it's actually slowing down the whole separation process for both species. So we're getting less of a separation, we believe, due to an entanglement, the size of the DNA, as opposed to this, which doesn't have that problem, we actually get a better separation that exists out of those. So this is the idea of the type of experiments that we've been working on to see, well, can this method work? Can flow oscillations actually give you a better separation? Well, we see that it can, but then the next question is, well, then how does, does this compare to other separation methods, right? How does this compare to using maybe gel electrophoresis or other things that they do on the microscale? And the answer is, not quite sure yet. Okay, we still need to analyze uh, both what we're doing and what they're doing and come up with a better comparison. So, conclusion kind of on the research section is, well, we did find that uh, oscillating electroosmotic flow does produce a sep uh, better separation, gives you enhanced separation um, for double-stranded DNA over uh, pure steady flow, and then there's a maximum that occurs in the amplitude. You can't just increase the amplitude and expect better separation. You get to a peak before the separation starts to go down. And so we hope to then continue our studies on DNA and then begin maybe into proteins and also into uh, cells. All right. Did you, see, did you see that same phenomenon in gases where, where you get a peak and then it goes down? Uh, yes, we did. It's that, a kind of a saturation phenomenon of some sort? I, I think saturation or what also may be happening is if you start to reach turbulent flow, mm -hmm. if you get to that point, then that will that'll totally um, decrease your separation. Turbulent flow, I know in microchannels is hard, but eventually you're going to reach that. But we also see that more in the, um, when we saw that in the, using the gases. Turbulence is a little bit easier to reach there. Can I ask you a question also? Sure. How sensitive is that process to the frequency? You did everything at 4 hertz there. It's actually very sensitive. It turned out that the, um, the previous grad student that worked on this found that that was the optimum frequency at which to work. And to go above that frequency, I think, was above the capability of the equipment that we built. So if we lowered it, what would happen is the actual separation, dish, uh, separation ratio would also be lowered. So we looked at the maximum that we could for the equipment, equipment setup that we have. And, and I've got a follow-up sure. question, too. So in your first diagram showing your, uh, you know, the piston mm -hmm. sort of model, mm -hmm. uh, and then you went to this get the acronym EOF mm -hmm. stuff. Could you use acoustics instead of oscillating electric fields? I think you can. I think you can. I think you can use acoustics. Anything that would produce that flow oscillation, I think, would work. Um, how that then affects, part of the problem I think we have with uh, DNA is, of course, they're charged. 
And so if you're putting a charged bias on it, that's going to affect their movement as well. We don't quite know how that the electroosmotic flow affects their specific movement relative to each other. The acoustics would take that out of the equation. So that would be a good thing to analyze, but we haven't, we, we don't have the capability to do that yet. But very good. Yes? Does this have the uh, uh, potential to um, resolve um, strands of DNA which have the same number of monomers in them but a different uh, configuration? I'm not sure. We have not tried that. I think it has the potential to do that, but what the resolution is going to be, I am not sure. Um, I suspect it's going to be much more difficult to do it that way, but I don't know because we haven't tried it yet. Very good. Okay, so again, I'm going to kind of totally switch gears and, and tell you a little bit about what we're doing with, with our uh, native students in Montana. And so again, the name of the research lab is Indigenous Research and in STEM Education, and this is our mission. Our mission is to do Indigenous Research and in STEM Education and advance our Native American students. Our Alaska Native, Native Hawaiian, First Nation students from Canada in STEM fields, uh, both STEM disciplines and uh, in their professions. So we have certain activities that we're focused on in this program. The primary activity we're looking at is for graduate degrees for our, our, our Native American students in STEM fields. And we're, but we, as, as Bev can probably attest to, it's very difficult to find Native students who want to get their graduate degree in STEM fields. And I think part of the issue is, is something happens before they come on campus as a freshman. They're having, there's not very many that come in as freshmen, therefore there's not that many that go through graduate school. So the idea that I wanted to do then is to work more with K through 12 and help build them up all the way through so that eventually, yes, they will have more students that will get their graduate degrees in STEM. So we're looking at this as more holistic. So native STEM education, what we've coined uh, K through gray. Actually, I haven't coined it. I, someone else coined it and I, I'm using it. So the idea is to work with very young students all the way through grandmothers. And we actually have a grandmother in our, in our program as well. But a lot of our native graduate students are what one might call non-traditional. They're a little bit older, they come back to school, have families, um, and go through the program. What we're also trying to do is build a relationship with the tribes and the tribal colleges on those reservations. And primarily now the focus has been on Montana. I've been focusing primarily on the Montana tribes and on the tribal colleges. And ultimately we're trying to work towards the betterment of indigenous peoples. So I want to show you a little bit of statistics on what's happening here in Montana with our native students. So for every 10 native student that steps on campus here, uh, tech, MSU, and the MUS system, half of, half of them have to take remedial math. Five of those 10 pretty much have to take remedial math. So already, that's tough. Already they have, probably have to add an extra one, if not two years, to their undergraduate education because they're already behind in math. 60% of our native students complete any sort of degree in four years. That compares to 85% for our non-native counterparts. So about 25 percentage points lower. Why can you sort of degree you include associates there, or you're not including this, this is not including um, the, um, the tribal colleges. Okay. Okay. This is just MUS. It's just MUS, but associates degrees and bachelor's degrees, or bachelor's I think it's just bachelor's. Yeah, so four-year bachelor degrees. When we're looking at the K through 12, when they take their uh, CRT test, and I believe that's around eighth grade or so for the math and science, 40% of native students are proficient in math, and this is from 2009 to 2013, and only 30% were proficient in science. And that compares to 70% and 65% of their non-native counterparts. And this is the one that really kind of gets me. So in the entire state of Montana, in 2012-2013, 57 native students took an AP class. We only had nine students pass with a three or higher, any type of AP test, whether that's English, whether that's math, anything, only nine. On, on two fingers, you can count as many that passed an AP exam in the entire state of Montana. Not only that, according to a recent study, and I believe this is just for STEM too, 102 PhDs were awarded to American Indian Alaska native students in 2012. But 20 years ago, there were 149. So we had a decrease in the number of PhDs that we have over 20 years. 
Now, the number's not high anyway, but to decrease, there's something's going on. And is it because number strings enrolling in this program, or they're not actually finishing the program? That, that I don't know. I actually think it's both. I, I think it's more that they're not enrolling, actually. That, that's just my, from what I've seen. So one of the areas we're trying to then work on is, well, how, how can we fix this? How can we work this? And one of the best programs I've seen that actually address this is actually up in Alaska. It's called the Alaska Native Science and Engineering Program, where they work with students from middle school through high school, through undergraduate and on through graduate school, all in the same program, working them all the way through. And they have been wildly successful. They have over 600 students that are in their program that are getting their degrees in STEM fields. So we're trying the same thing. They have a little bit of the advantage because where they get most of their money is from the oil companies to do this. So the gentleman up there had connections with the oil companies. He gets most of his money from businesses and corporations. In fact, he has foundations approaching him, wanting to be a part of this and giving him money. We don't have that yet. So I'm trying to start small and piecemeal things here and there where I can. One of the biggest enablers for us to do this is actually Montana EPSCOR, the IOE. They sort of give me my base funding that I can use to do a few of the things that I can then go out and, and go out and get other uh, grants to help support this. So I have a half-time student program coordinator that works with me. Um, I support a few of our graduate students through this uh, program. And also we have a lab specifically for native students. And the way the lab is set up, and I'll show you a little bit later, is for any native student that needs lab space, um, this is welcome for them to use. So I'll start with middle school. So what type of programs then we're working with middle school students? So we started this program called Science is Cool Montana. Uh, this is in conjunction with Gear Up. So we got some funding through Gear Up. Now I will rarely admit I'm not the best at acronyms or naming programs. So SICKEM, who knows? But this is what, what we called it. And so during the summers of 2013 and 2014, uh, we visited four different reservations. And so I brought some of our undergraduate and graduate students and we did week long, what I would call space camps. So we did rocket activities, we did hot air balloons, we did uh, roller coasters. Uh, we did a lot of these hands-on activities then with the students. And so we went to Browning and Harlem the first year. The next year we went to Hardin and Lane Deer. Um, and we worked directly with the middle schools with the gear coordinator to then work on these sort of things. Uh, we d I did this in Idaho during my time uh, there. We did this through a NASA program and we went out to the reservations. And in fact, my wife here, Susan, has helped with many of these programs and she didn't get paid, sorry. But she was a big help in a lot of those programs. So here's some pictures of some of the things that we did. So here's the rocket launch that we have going. This is up in Browning. This is a rocket launch that we actually did in Rocky Boy recently. Here's the hot air balloons that we put together um, that we launched over in Browning as well. And so we work hands on with these activities. And in all four cases, we had about 20 to 25 students that then were participated in that uh, one week during the summer. One of the things they do in Alaska, and I'm trying to replicate here, is we do a computer build. And so what we do is we have these computer parts, so nothing is put together. And we have middle school students put together their own computer from the motherboard, putting in the power supply, putting in the chip, the DVD player, everything they do with my direction, and they put together their own computer. But we tell them, this computer is yours, but, but you must complete Algebra 1 by 8th grade. So if they complete Algebra 1 by 8th grade, the computer is theirs. But not only that, I believe that then sets them up to take the right classes in high school, which then sets them up to be, not have to take remediation classes once they're in college. Now, even though it sets them up to take the right classes in high school, doesn't necessarily mean they take it. And I'm trying to work on some programs to make sure they actually take the right classes in high school. But this is a start. So we're really trying to get to those middle school students, get them interested in science, get them motivated to take the right math classes, and get them set up ready then for college. So here we had a couple of computer builds. Um, so one was in Ronan, the one on the bottom, this was over at Rocky Boy. And this is the computer build, again, that we're modeling after what happens in Alaska. How do they respond to that challenge? Okay, um, it, it is very interesting. So first I ask how many of you have built a computer before? And there might be one in there that, that has done it. And so I ask, well, how many are really worried about doing this? And most of them are like, I, I have no idea, I'm pretty scared, especially the, the, the girls. But as we go through it, they see that it's actually not that hard. 
And so at the very end, I ask them, okay, how many of you can go back and put in a second hard drive? No problem. They know how to do that. Do you want to put in more memory? Yeah, we got this. It's not really as difficult as I thought. So that I think they're a little trepidatious at first, but I tell them, I'll walk you through it. And as we walk through it, then it turns out to be uh, not, not too bad. Um, for those of you who haven't done a computer build, you might be thinking the same thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if I could do this. It actually turns out it's not so bad if someone walks you through it. So in high school, this is an area that I'm actually still working on. I need more activities to do in high school. I've been I'm writing grants and trying to see if we can do more of the high school like they do up in Alaska with their students. But one of the things that we have is we have a summer bridge program. So what we do at least is those that are gonna be freshmen um, in the fall, we're going to have uh, them come on campus for three weeks. And during those three weeks, they're gonna take a math class, a writing class, and a study skills class. They're gonna get familiar with campus. We'll do leadership workshops with them. We'll do a financial aid workshop with them, making sure they're all ready to go once they step on campus. And so we did this last year. Uh, this was funded by Embry. Embry funded this program. Uh, we had seven native students that attended last year. We originally applied for 15, but Embry told us like on May 10th that we were funded and you have to do all this by this summer. So we <laughs> scrambled to get something together. But this year they decided to refund it again. And so we're hoping to have 12 students this year. And so far um, we have about 10 applications. So that's good. So we're well ahead of where we were last year. Um, and we're doing the same sort of thing. We have a lot of saying that are teachers returning. We know a little bit better some of the programs to do. And also we've uh, partnered with um, MSU. So the main idea I had originally is for us to alternate between campuses where this would be held. UM one year, MSU the other year, back and forth. Um, MSU said they weren't ready, so we decided to do it again. But some of their staff is gonna come over and do some of our workshops as well. So for undergraduate, we've done a few small things. One, we have a, a math tutoring program that we've done. And what we're able to do there is we're able to have tutors that are at our Native American Center is invited to anyone that needs help in tutoring. And not only that, if they come for tutoring, I'm gonna put $4 on what we call our Grizz card. So essentially money that they can use to buy food, to use at the grocery store, those sort of things. So all I have to do is come, get $4, get tutored, and hopefully it helps them a little bit better in math. And so we've had about, each semester, about 20 kids that come through and use our tutoring program. We also have some undergraduate research that has been done. So again, EPSCOR or the Institute on Ecosystems provided funding for some of our uh, native undergraduate students to do some work. And this year, we actually have an REU program through chemistry. It's environmental chemistry focused. Our original plan was to have half of our students to be native. Uh, we had funding for six students to be in the REU program and four are coming from Browning. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, if, if you've done the REU programs here, you might have seen this, but in our applications, we probably had 115 applications and 110 came east of the Mississippi. So I think it's one of those where they say, Montana for the summer? Yeah, I could hang out in Montana for a summer. So we have actually two students also come from the East Coast as well to be with our native students. We're also part of the AMP program, which you all may be as well. This is the Alliance for Minority Participation. This is out of Sayers Kootenai College. And what they do is they fund undergraduate students, uh, they give them stipends. Um, if they maintain a certain GPA and if they're also in a STEM field. They also provide some funding for travel. And so I asked, is this travel to conferences or travel to any STEM related activity? They said, oh, any STEM related activity. Great, let's go to JPL. So I took students down to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in uh, California. We did, went there, we went to the Science uh, Center. We also went to the Griffith Observatory. We had a great time. So we had three students that joined us so here we are at JPL, of course, next to the mock rover that they had there as well. But I think what this did for them is they went there, down there and they saw, NASA actually is someplace I can, I can do. It's not this lofty place where that's just a dream. There's many different ac activities, many, many different jobs that one can do in NASA and actually have a chance to do something like this. For graduate students, I'd like to highlight a few of our graduate students that we have, uh, both here at UM and also here at Tech as well. So this gentleman, Don Malal, is actually graduating this semester. He's enrolled in the Oglala Sioux Nation. Um, he's gonna graduate in systems ecology and he's looking at ungulate browsing history um, in Yellowstone. So essentially how much browsing exists from, and he's looking primarily at elk for now. 
What he hopes to do when he goes back is to assist tribes with land management and assist sustainable development on with the natural resources, renewable natural resources on, uh, on his reservation. Don, thankfully, is actually going to continue on to his PhD after he's done here. So very excited for Don. The next student that will be graduating, his name is Casey Ryan. He's Salish. Um, he's in the College of Forestry looking at water hydrology. Um, when he's completed with his program here, he's, I believe he's going to work with the, uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service once he's done. He's been doing some internship programs with them during his graduate work, um, and he's been looking at surface and groundwater interactions. So these are a couple of UM students, a couple of tech students that are now here. This is Shannara or Shani. And how do you pronounce her last name? Spang Jian. Spang Jian, okay. One is her advisor. Okay, <laughs> great. So I believe she's Northern Cheyenne, she's doing work on Northern Cheyenne Reservation. She's looking at characterizing surface water and groundwater interactions uh, on her reservation, Rosebud Creek. Um, one of the interesting things that she's doing is she's looking to somehow integrate both Western science with um, traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK. Um, I'm very interested to see how the direction of her work and where she goes in trying to do this as well. Trying to integrate these two ways of knowing into her research. I'm going to kind of diverge for a second. You, you may have noticed this, especially with our native students. We've sort of had a shift in our graduate native students and what they want. It used to be a graduate student would come, they would see what you're interested in, and they would say, yes, I want to work with you. Well, now it seems more and more our native graduate students come, this is what I'm interested in, which faculty is interested in doing this? And sometimes that gets to be a little bit harder, a little bit more difficult to find faculty that are interested in what the student is interested in studying. But I think it's coming around, um, and we're working with both faculty and students to try to find a good middle ground uh, with this. But I'm glad to see what Shani is looking to do. Another gentleman just recently uh, graduated here from Tech, Martin Lorenzo. This is him here. This is Martin. So this is a, a gathering that we had of our Sloan students. I'll get to Sloan here in a moment at the University of Montana. So he graduated in environmental en engineering uh, last year. He looked at water sediment and outflow in from ponds near the Anaconda, Anaconda smelter. Um, and he was looking to see if the ponds were a source of sink of heavy metals. And Bev, do you happen to know what Martin's doing now? Yeah, he's working for the Bureau of Mines. Okay. Okay, okay. And two others I'm going to mention real quick from Tech. So Delilah Friedlander, who's also graduating now um, in geoscience or geochemistry. Um, well, that's when she entered in 2013, but she's graduating this fall. I'm oh, sorry, this spring. I think this summer. This summer. Okay, and Lee Kath looking, um, expected, expected to complete his MS degree in industrial hygiene in next May, this May, May 2015. Oh, awesome. So we're making some progress, but as you can see, we were talking about native students in STEM, and this is kind of representative of all of Montana, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So. And there are about four who were in that picture. So. Right, but even then, for the three universities to have 12 um, in STEM fields, we're, we're still working on this. Another activity that I was kind of involved in or brought into is we had this research and cultural exchange with our native students and India. So what we did is we took three of our native students to India to do some research with the villages in, well, Himalayas, we would say here, Himalayas is how you pronounce it there. And so we had a chance to take then some students to India. So here's a professor from one of the universities up there. And we worked with their graduate students as well in India. Then, in, in exchange, they came here, and they did some work up in Browning on the Blackfeet Reservation. So the same professors and students that we worked with there then also came here and worked with, um, with, with our students as well. For me, this was my first trip ever overseas, and I was in Delhi, which was quite a shock to my system, at least. Uh, but it was a great. Uh, the people there were wonderful. It was, it was a great trip that we had, and beautiful country. This came from, it was called the Obama Singh Initiative. So it was a joint um, agreement between the US and India to, for some of these programs. And that funding has since run out. We're trying to look to see if we can find other sources of funding. 
So here's the lab I just want to show real quick. So I do have a lab uh, that has glassware, has fume hoods, um, it has sinks that any native student is welcome to use. So we have some uh, students that really don't have a lab space or don't have a space where uh, they can kind of sit down and have a computer. And if that's the case, they're welcome to use this lab space that I have. I try to do some of my own research in here, but they're welcome to use it for whatever, whatever they need to do. Just trying to help them uh, get through their experiments that they need to do, maybe some of their calculations, if they just need a space to hang out. That's what this space is dedicated for. A couple of quick things, especially um, when our relationship with, with tech. So Bev and I work together on the Sloan Indigenous Graduate Partnership. So this is funding primarily for Native graduate students in STEM. And it's uh, for Montana. It's with us and Tech and Montana State. But it also involves Purdue, Arizona, and Alaska. And so we have a, it's called the, the partnership between our uh, institutions. And in fact, we had a student from Purdue that visited here three weeks ago, two weeks ago. So we were able to do some student exchanges that uh, existed. And so we brought a Purdue student here that visited all three campuses and gave a, gave a wonderful talk, a really good talk. Um, and uh, he's actually looking to go on to get his Master's of Fine Arts degree creative in creative writing. Yes, a very interesting person, but, but very good, very good person um, to, to talk to. The other one, very recent, is uh, AGUP that we recently received. Um, the Collaborative Opportunities for Success in Mentoring of Students in the Pacific Northwest. So Cosmos, it is called. Um, so this is also between UM and Tech and uh, MSU and SKC in Montana, but also with Washington State University of Idaho uh, Heritage University. And is Northwest Indian College supposed to be a part of this uh, as well? They, they are trying to get them in right. through uh, Washington State, but I'm, I don't think they've succeeded. Okay, yet. okay. This is, this is a unique program, and we're looking at a mutual mentoring model. And what we mean by this is not only looking to mentor the graduate students, but also mentor their major advisor as well. Not that we necessarily know that, well, this is what you should do, but we're trying to have maybe both pairs go through certain activities together. So one of those that is coming up is a rafting trip. So we're looking for some pairs of mentee, mentor, to participate in a rafting trip in, on the Salmon River in Idaho uh, this summer. But then there's also other activities that we hope to have planned during the, um, during the school year, mostly so a relationship can be built and maybe a mutual understanding between the two. So maybe the main reason for this is I remember talking to one of the faculty and they said, I took on a native student, but I had no idea what I was in for. And I think that's sort of maybe what it is for some of our faculty. There's just certain things that they do that you don't expect. They have obligations that you don't know about. Um, there's ceremonies that they go back to. These sort of things, that, these are sort of things we're looking to address with this program. And final one real quick. So tribal colleges, looking to build a relationship with tribal colleges. So I just got back from a recent trip where I visited all seven of them and put a lot of vehicles on a rented vehicle um, in Montana. And what, mainly what I do is I go and I say, okay, we're from the University of Montana. How can we work together or what can we do for you? Um, for those of you that deal with tribal colleges, you probably sort of realize you don't want to go and say, hey, I wrote you into this grant. Here's how much money I have for you. They do not like that. Um, if they're not a part of the planning process of that grant, many of them will just refuse it outright and say, no, uh, we're not going to be a part of this. One of the things that they asked for, there was two major themes from the tribal colleges. One they're looking for is tribal college faculty professional development, so professional development for their faculty, and also faculty exchanges, too. We're still working on the faculty exchanges, but I was able to get a grant from the NSF to do a, a professional development for the tribal college faculty. So what we're gonna do this summer is we're gonna bring nine faculty onto the UM campus for one week. We're gonna pair them with a UM researcher um, for the mornings, and then in the afternoons, we're gonna do some other type of workshops with them. The hope is, is in the mornings, they'll build they perhaps a collaboration with the UM researcher. Um, also, they may learn how to use certain pieces of equipment. There's been several times where I've gone to the tribal colleges, they have a room with brand new equipment, but then they tell me, we, but we don't, know how, we don't have anybody that knows how to use it or can keep it. Well, maybe this is a start to help them uh, be exposed to certain pieces of equipment that they, they can go back and use later. 
Um, also, they were excited to build community with other tribal college faculty. I, I couldn't imagine having to teach five classes a semester and then be told, oh, guess what? We also want you to do research, too. Um, there's a lot of demands on their time. And not only do they teach, they do a lot of other things as well. And so I think them coming together and kind of um, talking amongst each other about how things are going will be good in building community. So with that, I'd like to close my talk and give some acknowledgments. Um, again, a lot of the funding comes from Montana EPSCoR through the Institute on Ecosystems. Uh, National Science Foundation has funded a few of these programs along with Montana Embry. Gear up again, I mentioned with some of our K through 12. And also I'd like to acknowledge Bev. So Bev has been very helpful, uh, especially to me with the Sloan program and also with AGEP um, and helping me kind of uh, navigate through some of the things in Montana. Uh, we had a, a gathering of Sloan students up in Boulder Hot Springs. And so this is Lisa Loan fight from Montana State. But Bev's the one that kind of also helped uh, organize that as well. I've been very grateful for her um, involvement in all of this. So with that, I'd like to end my talk and ask if there's any questions. Some of what you're doing is involving outreach into high schools and trying to, um, how do you, you know, you're kind of a single person doing this. What, what do you see for sort of expanding what you're doing to get greater impact, in other words, you know, how do you clone a uh, hundred of you to make a, a bigger difference? I'm not sure if, if, if I know how to answer that quite yet. There's still, there's still some things that I'm trying to, to accomplish first. Um, but I think I am in some ways also training the graduate students that come with me and the undergraduate students that come out as well. A lot of them have said, I've never done anything like this before. I've never gone out and taught or worked with middle school students. And they become a little bit more interested in this aspect of their field. So not only do I do science, but I can teach someone else how to do science as well. So I think, at least for now, it's coming up uh, through, through those students in some form or another. But th this, this all takes time. So first, one has to build relationships with these tribes. Um, and once they kind of get to know you and know you're coming around and that you're not going to leave after your three-year grant is over, um, then they become a little more trusting and open and says, yes, we want to be involved in this, and yes, we want to be involved in that. Otherwise, they're a little, um, there, there tends, to, tends to be a little bit of distress initially. And so it just, it just takes time to build relationships with them. So I don't know if I have a, a great answer for you yet. Um, I'm still working on it myself. Yes? To what extent are the students, the graduate students and undergraduate students who go out with you, to what extent are they themselves Native American versus being not Native American, anything else, international, regular American, other minority groups? Right. So I would say about 80 to 90% of those I take out are Native. Um, so we might have one or two here that are non-native. And it very much opens their eyes as well, being on a reservation and sort of, wow, wow I didn't know like a place like this existed. Um, and so it's been good for them as well. But I, I'm really trying to help have the middle school students see that there's a graduate student just like them or similar to them in a STEM field. So it's having that a person that they can look to and say, OK, this actually is possible. There are people that actually can do this. So as much as possible, I am trying to bring uh, Native students to be, to be these counselors and mentors and such. Yes? What impact uh, do you have or do others uh, who are in the same, uh, looking at the same problems that you're looking at uh, have on traditional teacher preparation in university? teacher training, in other words, these are the teachers that will go back and go into elementary and high school teaching in uh, these uh, areas where Native Americans mm -hmm. uh, really predominate. Uh, and are, are those uh, institutional activities in an education department or college or whatever tuned to that, or are they ignoring that? I don't think they're ignoring it. Um, I have involved, I have actually tried to search out Native students that are in the education program. 
So those that are getting their master's in education or their undergraduates in an education field and have them come out to this. One of the things that's nice for, for them is they sort of know these classroom education, uh, classroom setting tricks, like how to get students to respond to certain things that I didn't know how to do. Like if you can hear me, clap your hands, you know, sort of thing. I, I didn't, I just didn't know. I, I'm an engineer. I didn't quite know how these things worked. But I think they're seeing, okay, I can institute maybe this activity into here. Or I can, this curriculum may be good for what I can carry on later. So some of them are going, I, I believe, are going to go back and use some of what we did in our camps maybe in their classroom. A little bit aside from that is we also had a component of our program that we did in Idaho that worked just with the teachers. So we had teacher training that we did um, on the reservation with the teachers that were there. I, I'm, I'm a little torn on how far that will go. And the reason is, is in Alaska, he has decided he's not dealing with teachers at all. Um, I, and I think the reason is, is when he initially was trying to get started, he got a little bit burned when he went and said, okay, I want your native students, um, please give me your native students to do this computer build and we'll get started. And they would say, essentially the effect of, they can't do it, I'm gonna have to give you these students instead. And so he has since began to sort of break those, those barriers down a little bit, but I think that turned him off then to working with teachers. Uh, Don, good to see you. Uh, but I think that we've come to a point where um, um, I think somewhere it's in the middle. I do want to focus on the students, but I know there's important aspect of working with the teachers as well. I haven't quite worked out the teacher part fully. Is the relationship between a tribal college in Montana and neighboring high schools, which are probably lar have large populations of native students in them? Is there a difference there than, say, if you compare that with uh, Montana Tech and the relationship we might have with Whitehall or neighboring high schools here? Um, is there a tighter relationship? Are there more interactions? Um, I think there's more interactions, but primarily there's more interactions because the community is smaller. And that's what I would think. So there, for example, in Lame Deer, um, the schools are very close to each other. However, I don't think there's as much interaction as there could be um, between what's happening at the tribal colleges and what's happening at the school itself. So I think it's pretty comparable to what maybe what we're seeing here. And I think the primary reason is because of how busy the faculty are teaching their classes. So there's less of a chance for them to then go down to the high school or go down to the middle school to do something else because they're doing quite a, they have quite a bit on their plate to begin with. And it's similar within a university. And we have quite a bit going on. And so some of us just don't have the time then to go down. Um, it also depends on the administration at the, uh, the super, whoever the superintendent is of the, the high school and the middle school. And apparently those change out quite often on the reservations. And so a new superintendent comes in, new list of priorities, things have changed. And so maybe what was established earlier with the tribal college, you know, now they're trying to do something different. And so I've heard that it's very difficult to begin things with the high schools and middle schools because the superintendent changes quite often. Yes? So how can faculty, students, whatever at Montana Tech get more involved with you and you know, learn from you? And we probably have 60 or 70 Native American students here. I think three of them are in distance graduate programs, mm -hmm. maybe mostly IH. Mm -hmm. The rest of uh, two of them are in, you know, in person, three of them in person grad students, and the rest of them, which is over 60, they're all undergraduate students in different programs. Right, Most right. of them are pretty engineering, you tend to that's not true. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't have any Native American faculty physically. Um, but I think you'll find in this room and in other places, a lot of people are very committed and would like to Glenn went to that mentoring workshop up at SKC mm, good. a month or so ago. Um, and um, I think he has a, one of your oldest child is, you have, you have kids, you have, you have kids, right? Yes. Who are, who are Native Americans? Um, they're Actually, African American. Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's which isn't the same yet. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> but um, so how can, you know, how, how can we partner with you, sir? 
we also don't have the IOE thrown money up here and other advantages like that. I, I hear some bitterness over there. <laughs> I hear some more bitterness. Uh, um, um, I, actually, I think the best way for me to maybe do this is when I do my summer camps is to invite some of your students to be part of this. Uh, it'll just be a little bit more difficult logistically, uh, but I think it would be possible. Well, like for example, when we're doing our, um, our summer bridge program, well, it could be that you all come and give a presentation yeah. as well, which would be great uh, for you all to come down and give a presentation. What I'm hoping to do once I, the high school portion that I want to get get going is students will come in the mornings and take a college level class. So this is probably more juniors and seniors. In the afternoon, they'll actually have an internship doing something. And so I'm hoping then maybe you all could be involved in maybe some of these internships that students could do in the afternoons, and maybe they could do their classes here and do an internship here. So that's a possibility that I'm trying to work towards as well. Um, but it may start with with having students as, as part of these. Uh, summer programs. Yeah, I mean, the, I know you're not so involved in this aspect, but I think you can say a little bit more about the mutual mentoring program um, in, term, in terms of basically that, that AGEP effort. There's a lot of social science research there to try to understand and define and structure um, that. I mean, isn't that right? I mean, I, I'm yes, not I'm, not, I'm not quite involved in that either. I mean, I'm not a social scientist either, but that's, NSF may AGEP have a significant social science research component. Correct. So there are faculty at UM in the social behavioral sciences and at MSU in the social behavior and also education right. who are putting together a study which will um, include people who are involved in the PNW Cosmos, but also other people right. um, in other places to try to understand, you know, what sort of mentoring maybe is most effective relationship can be most successful with Native American students and their communities. And so there's a lot of outreach to elders and to tribal communities that's at least planned. I'm not sure the, I mean, the project basically just got started. Correct. But to and actually, it sounds like you know quite a bit more of what they're trying to do than I do. Okay. Um, to me, it's been somewhat of a, of a black box. Yeah, it, it, to me, it's a bit of a black box. Also, where I'm on more of the telephone calls. Um, and, and that part is really, really interesting because, I, and I think that's part of the reason the project was funded. Because other people know that 20 years ago, there were 50% more American Indians getting PhDs in the STEM field, right? And every other, and then this is a number. Right. Leave aside the percentages. Correct. Okay? In every other minority group. Those numbers number have increased. And the percentages have gone up a lot. And the number have gone up more hugely because the number of po the population base, the utilizing body has gone up too. Right. And so the question is, why? why? And, and I think more importantly, how can we do different? How can we attract more of them in if they come keep them, get the degrees? And I think there are people who think that sort of recognizing the native way of thinking um, is going to be an important part of that. The other interesting that goes along with that is also with the ANSEP program, too. And so when they do their middle school, they don't teach a single class. Like they don't have them do like a math class or anything like that. So then why are they actually doing better and completing Algebra 1 by 8th grade than those that don't participate? Or why are students persisting where others have not in this program? Um, and they're starting to look at that as well. Is it because uh, there's a computer involved? Maybe or maybe not. Is it because they built relationships with uh, the people that are there and they see them year after year? That might be part of it. But they don't totally understand why it's working either. They just have realized through some, sometimes through trial and error that this is working. And I think there's a lot of those questions that are out there, like you mentioned, with, well, why are we decreasing when everyone else is increasing? What is happening? Why are these statistics so low and seem to be getting worse, even though we have more programs on Native communities than we did however many years ago? What is going on? Um, 
I am interested in that too, but um, like you mentioned, I'm not very much of a social scientist. I don't know how to get in there and figure out the best way to do things. For me, I just see one model that works, and I think it's going to work here, and that's what I'm, that's what I'm hoping to do. Yes? Do the schools um, place their education students who are teaching science um, to do their student teaching in high schools on the reservations? Or is it, are they? Of that, I am not sure. I don't know of a specific if they do that specifically, but I don't know if they're, they're not necessarily doing that either. I would say that they probably are simply because um, our Lee, which is on the Salish Reservation, is pretty close to ours. And I, I think they, they may send some students up there. So there's, not, there's at least a, a close opportunity to be able to do that. Years ago, um, I went to Indiana University, and they had a program where you could teach in non-traditional schools. And I taught uh, science on the North Pole Reservation. And um, it seemed like a lot of those teachers, a lot of people who had that experience, um, went on, continued to teach on reservations. Mm. And um, it seemed to be a good program. I always thought I would go back, but I never did. So, where on the Navajo Reservation did you teach? Many farms. Okay. My family's from Tohatchi and Window Rock area. So, on the New Mexico side, well, Window Rock's Arizona, but mostly on the New Mexico side. But it seems like that was just a good, a good way to mm -hmm. get, um, you know, both, for both sides, you know, to have um, teacher, extra teachers teaching science right. and then, then um, uh, having that experience and, and taking them in. So this was at Indiana, so they sent you down to yes. Navajo land. Well, I, I wanted to go. Oh. <laughs> they, we could go where we wanted to. Okay, but they specifically asked the class, then you should go teach on a, a reservation somewhere? They gave us the opportunity. Okay, good. If you were drilling down in that, in the, you had that page of statistics, um, and the one, in the one you said that bothered you the most in there was the only... Only nine students. Nine students passed with three or higher out of 57 in the AP test. Um, you know, that's a sort of a control uh, statistic in some ways. You've got, you've got already students who made it or who are enrolled in an AP class somewhere. Um, why, why is that? I and mean, why, if you were to go a little further, why, what do you think is behind that number? Part do, they teach, do they teach, for instance, AP classes? In Th the that's part of the problem. Not very many of the high schools on the reservation actually teach an AP class. Um, but I've, I've seen that some did at one time and no longer. Also, with the middle schools that I've gone to, and I say, well, I want your students to complete Algebra 1 by 8th grade. And says, oh, we used to have that, but we don't have it here any longer. And so you begin to wonder, well, then what's going on? How come at one time you had enough students to fill an AP class or to fill a class where I have Algebra 1 for your 8th graders, but you don't have that any longer? So I, I don't know. And, but that's, that's the part that, uh, that, that bothers me, is why was it here and it's not here any longer? What is happening that some of these higher level science and math classes are going away? Now, my suspicion is they may say, oh, well, we don't have enough students that are ready to take that class. Well, my counter would be, well, then how come you're not training your students then to be able to take this sort of class? Why was it there at one time and not here now? Is, is the pass rate higher than one in six for non-natives? Yes, it was. Yeah, it was very much higher. I, I'm trying to remember what it was. I think there was over 1,000 that took the AP and I don't remember what it was, but it was quite a bit higher. For me, the main thing is just thinking that there was only nine students in the entire state that even passed. So there was one student who got this special award at the Regents, a high school student, who was taking like Native American students taking like five or six AP classes and you know, passing them all. <laughs> Maybe they really skewed <laughs> the statistics. Or is it nine or is it nine See, passes? <laughs> <laughs> so really there was only Five students, <laughs> and one student passed five of them. Uh, 
No, I don't, I don't think it was quite like that. <laughs> And, and, I, and I think you'll find, at least this is my guess, that those students that actually passed AP classes were students that went to school in Billings, in Great Falls, or in Missoula. So Native students probably out of those communities. That, I'm, I don't know that, um, but that it would be my guess, simply because a lot of the reservation schools don't even offer AP classes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the, the parents also could have more education. It could be. And again, I'm just speculating. More questions? So um, let, let oh, yes, please do. The student, has there been a change in the uh, income of the students' families and in, the, in high schools where they might? I mean, hmm. as far as students passing tests and taking AP um, classes, um, I, I get the feeling that the ones that are more successful and more likely to get into those classes. And I've read in the newspaper with regards to uh, uh, schools in uh, Oregon that they all, they all mostly tend to be higher income students in lower income communities. Often they don't even have access to AP classes. The schools don't offer them. Right, right. Um, well, it, it could very well be that way. Um, but again, the thing that I noticed is when they tell me that we did have this at one time, but we now no longer have it. Yeah, that, that I don't know. Yeah, that I don't know. I don't know very much of the... <laughs> for someone else to do. Oh, yeah. Sorry, can, can I yes. I'm sorry for coming in late. Good That's all right. Yes, because you too. Um, you know, one of the things that I was talking with one of our, you know, Major Robbins, Robinson. I, I, don't think, I don't think I've met. Okay. He's on the board. We were talking about there's a committee on um, higher ed Native American. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that, that I, and this is just a brainstorm idea, right? So if we look at Western uh, down in Dillon, right, their retention rates were like in the 30s. This was like, what, 12 years ago when they started Experience One. You know what that is? I do not. So they, they teach their courses in a block schedule. So you take five three week courses, and you take one course at a time. This was at, at the college level. The college level. Yeah. Yeah. I know. This is this is maybe a little bit unrelated, uh -huh. but, but they their retention rates were in the I, I I don't know they were, but they doubled since then. So their freshman and sophomore retention. So they were their enrollment was at 800. They were you know in trouble, so they went to this they call it experience mm -hmm. block scheduling mm -hmm. one course at a time. Their retention rates went to they essentially doubled their completion. The graduation rates went from. 30s into the 40s, maybe low 50s, right? The six-year graduation rates, and so, so I was looking at that, thinking, you know, a model, you know, that that worked in that particular setting, a rural setting, and so then I went out. This has been a while, right? And there's a tribal college in North Dakota that's called Ford Ford Fort Berthold Berthold, mm -hmm. yeah, community college, right? And there was a they they got an NSF grant, and I'm going to say it was maybe in 2000 five or six, I'd have to look it up, right? To do block schedule. And their retention and completion rates almost did the same, right? And then then they stopped. It's almost like you said, right? They had this, right? It was, it looked like the data that they presented, and I found this article, that their completion rates, essentially, their retention rates essentially had orders of magnitude change. Their completion rates had, and, uh, so I went even one step further. I called and called and called. We could never get anybody there. Right? To essentially answer why, why answer did you my stop? Question, right? I couldn't yeah. get hold of the pre I tried to talk to the president of the institution. But, and so it kind of <coughs> fell off. But it just looks like to me at the college level, hmm. when you think about experimenting, right? Um, I'm not so sure it wouldn't work on this campus, you know, a lot of scheduling. And we've done some of that with our remedial math courses, right? We've done that. Highlands College. Our numbers are small, and we're really not sure whether or not we're getting the same kinds of things. Right? We've essentially done the same thing at um, the Highlands College. For the I, I know. I just throw it out at you as no, that's as good. A concept. And do you know of any other tribal colleges that have even tried something? Like that? No, I don't think any of them are doing any sort of block scheduling that I'm aware of. One's on a quarter system, which is a little bit different, uh, but other than that. 
they're trying different things in terms of math and how to do their math me remediation, remediation a little bit different, more computer-based. Um, but that's about it, but no block scheduling. So what they do is they take, for example, what you're saying, math for three weeks and just math. Mm -hmm. And then they do writing for three weeks, but just writing. And then, then okay. And, and typically they also offer, a, they call it an arch course, an overarching course, which is Monday, Wednesday, Friday for an hour. And you can so if you want to take 18 credits, you take one course that goes the entire semester and then you take these five blocks. It's, I don't know, just, they still offer some of those at, at, at Ford, Berthold. Berthold. Uh -huh. Are they still doing that? And it's really a small number. Right? Are they still doing that in Dillon? Western is entirely on the block schedule. But, but like Don said, they have some courses, like maybe it's a foreign language. You can't like do a foreign language for three weeks and then go off and do something else. So they might have, if they're doing a foreign language, they might do it. Um, they, you know, kind of all interspersed so through. They're also doing teacher preparation. And you can't do your, te your student teaching in three weeks. <laughs> so I bet they wish they could. That's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Colorado College did that. They sort of um, copied it from Colorado College. Western is the only public school that does that. Does that? Okay. Correct. I've seen this idea of the flipped classroom, too, people are trying as well. Yeah. Where they're essentially saying, we'll do the homework in the classroom and you have to look at the lectures before you come. Right. Yeah, I don't know. All right, thank you very much for coming, and good luck on the rest of your finals week.